Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into arms. Can you believe that after this episode, there's only going to be five episodes left of this whole muscle series? This has been a journey. I know. That means there's been 12 episodes before this one that have come out. That is pretty insane. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys have been enjoying it and making sure that you're giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts and sharing with a friend because that is the one thing that we ask people to do to give away all of this information for free and spend months and months doing this was all you got to do is hit share and send it to a friend, which is also free to be able to do. Leave us a review, subscribe, all those things. Yeah. Well, awesome. Let's dive into it. It's sun's out, guns out today. We're going into (laughs) some arms. Bicep and triceps. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to start the episode off with? Let's dive right into what what the function of these different muscles are. Okay. So bicep and triceps are going to be very, very simple. The bicep is going to flex the elbow, and then the tricep is going to extend the elbow. That at its core is going to be the main function of both muscle groups is going to be dictating if the elbow is flexing or if it is extending. Gotcha. So with that, what do I need to know about the muscle in and of itself? Do I need to know about that origin and insertion? Is that going to help me here? I think it'll be helpful to understand the origin and the insertion of the the bicep and the tricep. We'll start with the bicep. So we have uh, the biceps being separated into two separate heads. We have the long head and the short head. Now, both are going to Uh, originate on the scapula and they're going to insert on the radius. So if if you were to extend your hand and have your palm facing outward, the radius is going to be on the outer portion of your forearm. And that's where the bicep is going to be attaching. For the tricep, we're going to have three heads. We have the long head, the medial head, and the lateral head. The long head is going to originate on the scapula, and then for the medial and lateral head, they are going to attach at the top portion of the humerus or your upper arm. And then all three of them are going to insert on the ulna, which again, if we put our palm facing away from us is going to be on the inside of your forearm, whereas the bicep is going to attach on the outer portion or the outer bone, if you will, on the lower arm. And, you know, an easy way to remember that one has two heads versus three heads is bicep, by two, tricep, tri, three. I mean, it's all in the name. They make it easy for us. A lot of times they don't make it easy for us. But in this one, they make it a little bit easy for us. Yes. And with the bicep, we have the brachial radialis, which is going to run under the bicep itself, which is going to be a big part of just the functioning and flexion of the elbow. But we're going to give that more uh, love and time on the forearm and calf episode. Yeah. And that's in a few episodes. So you're going to have to stay tuned for that one because the next episode after this, you actually dive pretty deep with Chris Bearcat all about your guys's favorite exercises and really putting together the best supersets and trisets to be able to have massive arms. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic episode. We talk about research. Chris is a wealth of knowledge and it was fantastic getting to chop it up with him for a little bit over an hour, I imagine. Mm-hmm. And with the bicep, although it is a smaller muscle overall, it is very pivotal and it has a very important task to support the humeral head within the shoulder joint. And so we've talked about the shoulder joint before and just how it is a more fragile joint altogether. And so being able to have that support from the bicep, um, just give it some more support, help it out a little bit is great because it is a more fragile joint as a whole. Sure. And a little fun fact, did you know that the tricep is the only muscle on the posterior compartment of your arm? Posterior compartment. Posterior side (laughs) of your arm? Um, I didn't think about it until just this moment, but yeah. yeah. So fun fact. Fun fact. Brand new information, basically. (laughs) 
All right. All right. Well, I know I talked about having massive arms, but just talking about arms in general, what's the benefit of training our arms? I think there's a lot of benefit uh, to training arms. Are we saying just for the the sheer benefit or are we talking visuals? Because I think that arms are a big part of just a, a visual representation. Let's talk about visual because I know you want to. <laughs> I think that uh, arms are a big part of, of completing a full upper body look. I think that it is a large contributor. Now, the beautiful thing within arms is that you can have too much of a priority on biceps and triceps to where they overpower your delts and make your shoulders look smaller. And so then it looks like you've got this hot dog as an arm <laughs> and it is not a good look. <laughs> it's just not. And so you should first focus on building delts. This was my mistake. I focused on all arms. When I first started training, and we talked about this uh, a number of times on the podcast, when I first started training, I was training just arms, deadlift, and squat. Those are the three things that I did. I did nothing else besides deadlift, squat, train arms. And so I had the hot dog arm. Now, as I filling out my shirts, I was lit. I was wearing my Hollister and Abercrombie shirts <laughs> that were size medium, potentially small, depending on how much I weighed at the time, okay. maybe 120 pounds. And I was filling out those shirts. I felt great. But then I saw that I had the hot dog arm and I couldn't deal with that anymore. So then I started to incorporate a little bit more training and got my delts to grow a little bit and having the pop of your delts, but also still being able to fill out the shirt with your arm is a, a much better overall look. And even for the guys who want to wear the boxier shirts now, there's still a level of, of arm density that you need to have when wearing those shirts. Like you don't want to just be swimming in that boxier shirt. You still want to have some shape to your body composition when wearing the boxier, wider shirts that you have on. Um, so I, I think that it is a very important tidbit. <laughs> so are you still trying to grow your arms right now? I think that I'm always trying to make my arms look better. Mm -hmm. Is that density? Is that just consistently having they some look good volume? On, with that shirt right Thank now, you. they're just pressing up against it, giving Thank you, you that this shape. This is amazing. This is exactly what I needed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to help. So if, if you're looking at the bicep and you are looking at yourself in the mirror and you are thinking, man, my arms look uh, not wide. They're like narrow and my arms look slender. That's often going to be something where uh, developing your, your brachialis, which we'll talk about in the forearm and calf episode, will be tremendously helpful because it's going to give you a little bit of density and width to your forearm, but also density and width to the upper arm as well. If you feel like from the side, you have someone looking at you and you're like, man, it's, this is not my not my angle from the side, it's generally going to be more developing your triceps. And so the big part of your arm, if you're wanting to just grow your arms in general, is getting your triceps to grow. And so I would focus on triceps over biceps if you're like, I want to just feel confident in shirts and, and feel more confident in my clothing, I'm going to bias more of my training volume towards triceps because they make up a larger portion of your upper arm. And I think that generally speaking, a lot of men want bigger arms and a lot of women want smaller arms or more toned arms. Because I think that's where people get confused if they are like, well, I don't want to train my arms because I don't want my arms to get big and jacked. And I understand that completely and fully. But I think that if you do want that toned arm look, that comes from having muscle tissue and then losing fat. And I know a lot of fitness professionals hate the word tone, but or being toned, but I actually think it's a good word to describe it because you are getting muscle tone to be able to have that look, which looks defined and gives you some shape. So your arm's not just a noodle, but it also is something where you feel um, uncomfortable if you're taking a photo and you're like, oh my gosh, my arm looks huge in this, um, where being able to have some muscle tone really, really helps. Because otherwise, I feel like it literally just looks like a skeleton arm, like hanging off with some flesh over it. Um, and that that is a look that really does personally give me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> a little bit of the heebie-jeebies. I was watching a show the other day and the girl literally had no muscle to her arm whatsoever. And she was so thin. It was frightening to me. I'm a, I'm a little nervous that super skinny is coming back. Yeah. Like a Tim Burton. It looked like a Tim Burton character. If I knew who that was, I would say If you look totally. it up right now, you'd be like, yeah, for sure. Tim. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't know. <laughs> what, what do I type in? Just Tim, Tim Burton, Burton movies? It, it will, you'll immediately see what I'm talking about. Okay. So it's like the, what are these movies called? Like uh, Tim Burton movies. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's not it. No, it literally Jack, is called a Tim Burton movie. Jack Skellington. He's like a character on something specific. Okay. A Tim Burton movie? Whatever. I guess he did also the uh, Batman movies. The Joker, Bruce Wayne. I mean, what a what a guy. Okay, back to muscles. <laughs> Biceps and triceps. Mm -hmm. Not having skeletal arms. I think that one part that women do not love is that they will carry more body fat to their upper arm. Mm -hmm. And so then they're not wanting their arms to be more bulky. And that's what deters them from training arms. And that's just going to be a matter of them losing body fat and probably training the tissue. We've talked about this in previous episodes. I believe it is the quad episode of just Sue and I, where she was a part of Bill Campbell's body by science, body by science research. You were a contributing person expert. and expert contributing expert. <laughs> and there's some more recent research that does speak to some spot reduction. Do you have anything to say to that right this moment? It, it's very new research and it's one study, uh, but I do think that, I, I guess I, I've always been someone where I don't think, oh, if I do a million crunches, then all of a sudden I'm going to have ripped abs. I used to think that back in the Dizzy, but it's something where I think logically it doesn't make sense that if I am specifically training a muscle, that that doesn't cause me to be able to tone or be able to lose fat from that space. So of course, a big part of it is genetics, where you store your fat, and then what body fat levels you are at overall. But I think that it's only going to help of being able to train that muscle group, of being able to burn calories. And again, you're growing that muscle, which that's going to give you that tone, and having more muscle to your body burns more calories overall. So that's something where people often assume that I eat like a bird, or I eat very little amount of food. And when they're around me, they're like, oh, you actually eat a lot. And it's like, yeah, the more muscle you have on your body, the more calories it's burning. So you can eat enough food. You can eat more food and still maintain a body structure and body fat level that you might have not been able to achieve if it was just looking at your actual fat stores. Because again, if you don't have that muscle to complement it, then you end up either looking skinny fat or in a place where you look like Skeletor. Sure. So yeah, I think that there is certainly benefit to training the tissue, being in a calorie deficit, and then seeing the change that you're actually wanting to see in your arms, not being in a situation where <clears throat> you're not training arms at all, but you want your arms to look more toned and look better. And so you get into the calorie deficit, not training arms, not really training maybe as much delts. And then you get to the end of your fat loss and you're like, I wanted my arms to look different than what they look like right now. That's probably because you're not spending the time training. So I would encourage training. Mm -hmm. But like I said, there is a genetic factor and some people just do store more body fat in their upper arm. And that's something where you might have to diet for longer to see the fat loss because that might be one of the last places it comes off of. And there's not much to do about that except go back in time and have different genetics. Well, one thing to do with that is as you go through dieting phases, you're going to see those spots be different. Mm -hmm. So as you go through different diets, you may see areas where you thought you lost body fat quicker now being last and vice versa. And so that could be, you know, part of your experience, but part of that is getting out of the dieting phases, not being in this perpetual state of dieting and being able to go in and out and have maintenance and then diet again when the timing is right and so on and so forth, um, which we're again, getting far off of topic and off of arms, but here we are. And we'll, I'll bring it back to arms and talking about different daily activities that we use our arms in and not just on an arm day or training our biceps or triceps. So things like carrying groceries, which I know we have mentioned and quite a few things, but there's a lot of muscles that contribute to carrying those groceries, um, lifting up your children, uh, being able to hang curtains, open up a door. Those are all going to be things that you're using your arms for. Yeah. I mean, pushing yourself out of bed, Yeah, all the things that you'd be lifting your, like, as I get up out of the seat, I'm going to be using my triceps. I think that your triceps are being utilized a lot throughout your day. Uh, your biceps, maybe not as much in, in your day-to-day -day activity. I don't know how much you're picking up and, uh, well, as you're picking up the fork and putting it to your <laughs> mouth, I suppose your bicep is contributing to that. Um, but it's, it's going to be things that are, they're not the, the main driver per se, but they're contributing to a lot of the actions that you're doing with your hands, which is a 
lot of the actions you do throughout your day. Mm -hmm. So biceps are going to be a lot of lifting and carrying, and triceps are going to be more of like pushing um, and being able to throw even, um, and part of lifting as well. But yeah, it's the main gist of things. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps, carbs low are weight. needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats knees. are great. You for should your knees. squat astrograph. It's fine. It macros fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So what reason should I train arms outside of if I want them to look a certain way or if I want to be able to carry my groceries? Um, is there a reason that I should train arms outside of that? I think that there is value in training every muscle group. Just to have adequate function, having adequate coordination, that is literally, that is needed for everyone from the ages of... 10 years old until the the time that we we move on. Like I, I think that being able to train every muscle group in some capacity is going to be important for every muscle group, for every person. Yeah, and I think that I hear a lot from clients of one of their big things is they want to be able-bodied as they age to be able to do things with their own kids, with their grandkids, and just being able to move around. And it is a fact that at the age of 35, after 35, you start to lose muscle mass and that's something that even when you get to the age of 60, you start to lose muscle mass at a higher rate. Um, then at 35, I believe it's at 1% muscle mass per year. And then at 60, it's at 3%. And so being able to just train these different body parts and training your arms can help you a ton with staying active, staying mobile as you age. And I think that that can never be understated. If we do one thing through physique development for the rest of eternity, is just encourage everyone to train two days a week, three days a week, and just take care of their body for the long haul, then I feel like my job is done. Like that is all. If I can just get that into the masses to where it's actually being implemented, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it really can be that simple. And often it's just simply overcomplicated for the sake of what they've done previously or what information they've been told. And it's, like people in the past have tried to overcomplicate it to make it be like, no, you need me. You need me. It's like you have every free resource that you possibly could at this moment, especially through us. Mm -hmm. You use our YouTube, you use our podcast, you have every tool that you need. You're on our email list. You get all those freebies. So I mean, all we do is give stuff away for free. Literally. You, like we have people messaging us regularly saying, I used your YouTube, I used your podcast. And this, these are the results that I got losing 50 pounds, losing six, like all these things have happened. And it's just a matter of taking the information and being able to apply it. Um, and if you feel like you need the accountability, that's what we're also here for too. And being able to work with us one-on-one -on -one and expediting that process because the people that just took our podcast and took the YouTube, they definitely hit some bumps in the road while they were trying to figure things out. Whereas the one-on-one -on -one coaching expedites that process and you're able to use that knowledge and have it applied to you directly relative to trying to figure out how to apply it directly. We already have that tool for you. So, Especially if you're going through life changes because I have a lot of clients where we've talked about it before. A majority of our clients are on four-day training phases, which they normally come from training five or six days a week. And a majority of our clients are on that four days a week. And I'm having a lot of clients right now going through a lot of things in life, whether they're becoming pregnant, they have some crazy stuff going on with work or their kids, anything like that. And we're transitioning them to three days, still seeing progress, still knocking it out of the park. But that's something that they felt a lot of resistance to of, oh, I, I've always done this many days, I need to do this. But being able to really talk through it, talk through their schedule, put something in place, they feel better about it. It's a lot more realistic. So they're able 
able to actually accomplish it each and every week. Uh, so it makes them feel a lot more confident about the plan and being able to follow it without that hesitation. Absolutely. I had a, a call today with a, a potential client who is postpartum. Mm -hmm. And she was curious of some of the other training that other postpartum clients of mine uh, are in. And I have five right now who are postpartum. And all five of them, the training looks different for all of them because their circumstances are different. So there's one that is able to go into the gym four days a week and get the training done. There's one that's three days. There's one that's a two-day training at home. There's one with three days of training at home. And then there's one that has five training sessions, but she's only able to train for 25 minutes five days a week. And so we're able to fit those sessions in to those small pockets. And that's where the one-on-one -on -one coaching individuality really comes into play of being able to have that specific nature of fitting it really into your schedule and not it being like, well, we do four days, we do five days, we do six days, and you have to fit into what our protocols are. It's like, we meet you where you're at and then take you to where you want to be. And that's the, the, the art of it all. Well, another off topic, but important conversation to have. I think they've been some good things here. So do you want to go ahead and dive into your favorite exercises for the biceps and triceps? Sure. All right. What are your favorite <laughs> exercises? Let's start with biceps. So with the bicep training, I really enjoy just a facing away single arm cable curl. So I'm facing away from the cable. The cable is pulling behind me and... Um, it's going, you're literally just curling. You're wanting to make sure that the cable is aligned with your elbow and wrist uh, as you are going through the curl itself. As you get to that end range, if the cable is making contact with you, then you probably want to bring the cable down a little bit. But as long as the cable is not making contact with your forearm or your elbow, everything's lined up nicely. It's going to feel amazing. <laughs> so are curls really the only exercise to do for biceps? Yeah. I mean, we talked about it earlier of it main function is going to be uh, flexion of the elbow. So all of your movements are just going to be varying positions of the upper arm relative to the weight that's being applied, whether it be cables or dumbbells. Um, and that's going to alter what position of the bicep length. So if our arm is, is fully extended, the elbow is fully extended, this is going to be the lengthened position of the bicep. As we are about 90% of the way or at a 90 degree angle with the elbow, this is going to be more of the mid range for the bicep. And then as we get to full flexion of the elbow, this is going to be the shortened position of the bicep. And so depending on where the cable or the dumbbell is placed, and where the upper arm is placed, we're able to change the bias of the position that we are challenging the bicep in. And that's going to be the main difference of your bicep exercises. Mm -hmm. So you said your favorite is that facing away single arm cable curl. What are the ones that you most commonly program um, for your clients? So the, the facing away is, is one because it is a lengthened biased exercise. And we don't have a I have a few clients who are like have an arm day because their focus is growing their arms. Uh, but for the most part, their arm volume is going to be fitting into an upper body day. So we don't have a ton of volume. And if we're wanting to see uh, growth in that area, we might as well bias more of the lengthened position um, with the exercise selection. So the facing away cable curl is a, a must. I really like the, the preacher curl as well. Not going to be as lengthened bias, more of a mid-range specific exercise, um, but that's going to be a, a really great output and your arm is in more of a fixed position. You have the opposing force of the uh, the pad under your, your tricep that's allowing you to have more stability. So I like the preacher curl a lot. Um, Again, we'll talk about the brachioradialis in the forearm and calf episode, but I love a hammer curl and a, a calf, or I'm sorry, a calf. Mm -hmm. um, a supported hammer curl is great as well. Uh, there's a video on my Instagram of me rigging up the prime functional, not the functional trainer, but the prodigy rack and using the catch bar as a support for my <laughs> <laughs> bicep curl. So if you have the uh, prodigy rack from prime, then there is a resource for you to set up the, <laughs> the supported hammer curl. Um, but the, the preacher, the facing away cable curl, uh, I, I think that something with the arm being elevated, that's going to allow for you to bias more of the shortened position of the bicep can be beneficial, but you can really get, if you wanted to have a, a full arm day, you could have six exercises sizes, three being bicep, three being tricep, and 
absolutely murder your arms and be done and uh, see a lot of growth. Do you have a full arm day right now? In my training right this moment? That is the question I asked you, yes. Wow. <laughs> no, I do not have a full arm day. Okay. Do you have a full arm day? Uh, well, as the person who writes my training, <laughs> uh, no, I do not have a full arm day. That's not my um, focus Do you want to have right a full now. arm day? I don't, no. You want to get just juicy biceps My arms and are pretty jacked, you do. honestly. Yeah. So I'd rather just continue to grow my delts at this point. That's fair. Um, I would imagine that there are a lot of listeners that want their arms to look similar to yours. So if you well, want to give, you. you're welcome. Um, what is it that you do for biceps and triceps? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's not groundbreaking, honestly. It's that I normally have um, one to two sets um, in an upper session of one set of bicep, maybe one set of triceps, and I have two upper days a week. And so I'm getting from anywhere from two sets of biceps altogether throughout the week. So two to four or two to four of triceps. Um, and that's all there is to it. And I've honestly been doing a lot of the same exercises for biceps and triceps, uh, repeatedly over and over because they're just there isn't a ton of variation that you can have within those exercises but I do really like a supinating dumbbell curl um, and then a favorite for our clients is the incline uh, dumbbell curl just because that's something especially in busy gyms um, if they don't have access to the cables and we do want to do things with both arms instead of having to do one arm at a time since a lot of big gyms honestly nowadays don't have functional trainers they'll have like the big cable rack but then you can't do both arms at the same time for yeah. like a facing away or facing towards type of thing. You could do it with a hammer curl with a rope, but um, it's nice to be able to have the option to do that incline curl um, with the dumbbells. Yeah. Now for, you said one set, I feel like you have more than, I mean, I program, you've got more than one set. I don't program just one set of these exercises. Well, it's got one exercise. exercise. Yeah. I, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One exercise, it's normally two to three sets yes. per exercise. So normally you have three to six total sets yes. of bicep and tricep separately mm -hmm. per week. Now, you obviously have the other volume from your pushing and pulling exercises that are going to have some carryover into your bicep and tricep volume. Um, but for the most part, your large goal within your arms, now you've had more arm volume in the past, um, and, but your large focus right now is seeing your delt density come up. And if you're wanting to see your delts have a little bit more pop, maybe a little bit more shape, letting your bicep and tricep kind of come down a little bit, it's not a bad thing. It's gonna help, honestly, in terms of the visual appearance, allow for that delt to have a little bit more prominence there. But I think that's a perfect example of, I'm not training for growth for my biceps and triceps. I'm training at a maintenance volume to be able to maintain the muscle that I have and being able to be in a spot where I'm still using and working that muscle, but that doesn't mean I'm trying to grow the hugest arms. And I think, again, that's where people have a misconception of, oh, since I do a bicep curl uh, once a week, then all of a sudden I'm going to have these huge arms. And it's like, no, it's good to move your body in the way that the actual muscle is supposed to move, but it doesn't mean that you're trying to grow them. And I think that's an important discernment when we're looking at training. Very important. Because you see it on the flip side within like individuals who want to grow their glutes, they don't want to touch any quad. Yeah. It's like, well, you need, you need to do some quad. It's not that you're going to do this three sets of leg extension and all of a sudden your quads are going to be massive, but it's going to help with the stability of the upper leg. And so the same thing is going to apply with the bicep and tricep volume. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about triceps. What are some of your favorite exercises for triceps? So tricep wise, right now I am in deep deep love with the JM press. I knew it. I the just knew it. easy bar. So we have an extended easy bar that goes on the rack. I absolutely love this movement. I love this movement to my core. The JM press feels fantastic for me. You're just letting the, you have your arms extended. And then as you are lowering the bar, you're just letting the elbows glide. You're staying in this 45 degree angle. If, if all the way out to your shoulders and then all the way to your sides, you're right in the middle there. And then you're just letting this glide down. You find this bottom position. The stretch is fantastic on the tricep. And then all you're doing is just pushing your elbows back towards you. And it's, I mean, it is a magical <laughs> stretch. And also just the the fullness, the tension, everything is top tier. So the JM press is at the top of my list. 
And then everything below that is all cables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been really, really into the JM Press recently. Um, and I think it's just you kind of got the right setup. You played around with it to really make sure that you could nail it for you. Because I think you've tried it a few other times before and it hasn't felt the best. Um, but you kind of messed around with it and now really have it dialed in. Yeah, I've tried uh, I've tried with the Smith machine and I don't love the bar being that fixed. Mm -hmm. And um, I literally bought the, I don't use this easy bar for anything for else. Anything else. <laughs> no. I bought this bar solely for this and it is so worth it. And I would do it 10 times over because <laughs> I love this exercise. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, some of the other exercises, one that I commonly program for clients is a cross cable tricep extension um, or single arm tricep extension. That's a big favorite. What are some uh, main tidbits that you have to give clients on that particular movement? The big thing is lining up the cables, um, and that's why it's so helpful to get the videos back from clients to be able to go through it, because I find that the videos we have going over the exercises are incredible on YouTube. I'm not dissing those at all. I'm very proud of those. But sometimes it just helps to have a second eye if you're not used to looking at it, because we've had people be like, I think I'm doing the same thing. We look at the exercise, and we're like, hey, compared to this video, here are two or three things that need to be changed here. And I think the lineup is a huge huge part of it, of making sure that, especially for that cross cable, the cable is going through your shoulder joint and your elbow joint. So when you have those arms extended, it's not like the cable is way above the arm or way below it. And that can also help with like when people feel joint pain, a lot of times, not all of the time, a lot of the times it's due to poor setup and like the execution of the exercise. It's not truly of like, oh, I just feel joint pain whenever I do this um, or whenever I try to work out. It's like, if we can set this up a little bit better, we can fix a lot of that um, and make sure that things feel smooth like butter. I will solidify this and say that it is 100%. If you're having elbow pain and a tricep pushdown, you've got two reasons why this is happening. One is the misalignment. So if you're having inside the elbow pain, it could be that the cable is too low. If you're just having elbow pain in general, it's going, the cable's misaligned somewhere. The second option is that you are having very poor control of the cable. So as you extend the arm, you're not controlling the eccentric, and then you're being very irky jerky as soon as you get to the elbow flex position and you're trying to push it back, you are like generating a lot of force that's not really more muscular tension, but you're displacing it onto the joints. So having more control in the extremes of when your elbow is fully extended, and then also when it is fully flexed, those two spots being able to have control and then making sure that the cable cables are aligned will eliminate all elbow pain. Wow. Facts. Mic facts. drop. What are your feelings on dips, whether it be on a bar or like, let's say on a bench and um, those working triceps? They're certainly going to, to work triceps. If you are someone who is wanting to also grow your chest, like, I don't think that it's a movement where you're saying this is only chest. This is only tricep. You may be able to change your body positioning to better bias one or the other. But I would generally look at it in a way of this is split within tricep and chest volume, um, because it's really going to come down to, if we want to get into the real semantics of this, is how much are we seeing elevation of the shoulder? And then how much of it are we seeing is elbow flexion? Because if we're seeing a lot of, of elevation and then depression of the shoulder, the chest is, is going to be playing the role there. But as we are seeing the extension of the elbow, the tricep is going to be playing a large role. Now, for everyone listening, when you get into a dip machine, what situation do you have where you're going to be able to eliminate some of that elevation, but only see elbow flexion and vice versa? It's, it's not going to happen. So you're going to get the tricep work there, but I wouldn't use it as like, this is my main exercise for my tricep growth. It's going to be a contributing, but if you're wanting to better isolate and have this be my tricep big movement, I pick something else like the JM press. <laughs> what about something like a tricep kickback? So uh, I, if, you, if you're wanting to use it, I would encourage it to be on a cable, but at the same time, if you just look at the positioning, it's not going to be a whole lot different than what you would have of just a 
tricep pushdown. Um, but if you like the positioning, you feel like you have better overall maybe control or you feel like you have better uh, tension towards the tricep and it's just what you prefer, then run with it. It's not, a, it's not wrong, but you may be able to handle more load if you're just standing and being able to do a tricep pushdown. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So what are some common mistakes that you see with arm training? Common mistakes are getting so married to weight selection and feeling like progressive overload is only specific to load selection. So with biceps, with improving your lateral raises for the medial delt, those type of exercises are going to take time to see weight progression. Your rep quality is going to be the main form of progression you're going to see week to week, month to month. And then randomly, six months down the road, you're gonna go up five pounds and be like, finally, I did it. And it's then you're gonna go through that same progression. The rep quality is going to improve, your ability to withstand fatigue, adding overall volume, and then again, oh my gosh, I can go up another five pounds. But if we were to see a weight progression every single month in a bicep curl, all of us would be curling 80 pound dumbbells. And that is not the case. <laughs> and anyone I'm seeing doing 80 pound dumbbells are not doing those curls very well. Um, and so load is not going to be your, your massive driver here, improving the execution of the exercise and then improving the reps, improving the RPE scoring. Those things are gonna be your main things that you're tracking. And then randomly, you're going to see yourself go up and wait. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the biggest mistakes I see is that elbow placement or even just the whole upper arm. Because if we get into it of like, let's talk about tricep um, pushdowns, if someone gets into the place where their uh, shoulders start hunching over, and then they're getting into uh, that position as they're pressing. Um, and with we see it with bicep curls and tricep extensions of just that upper arm moving back and forward. And it's really more of exactly what the function of the muscle is of that extension or flexion at the elbow. And so being able to keep your upper arm more steady and being able to use it of like, I think that one of the big um, like light bulb moments for me is when I was doing tricep extensions and you just placed your hand right behind my elbow and we're like, okay, press into this as you go through it. Or I was like, oh, I have not been targeting that muscle the exact way that I should be um, for a long time. Yeah. With, with triceps, people are kind of like pulling it with their rear delt and like upper back kind of like pulling it in this fashion. And it's this like one continuous motion. Whereas it's not even a matter of I'm locking down my shoulder. Yeah. It's just that you're wanting to have stability and then being able to have some movement to the elbow, fair game. But we're wanting to have pretty much the, the same positioning so that we're just focusing on the extension of the elbow. Um, and, and similarly with the, the biceps as well. I, I think that the arm can be out in front of the, the body or slightly behind, um, depending on how we're applying weight, for example. But um, yeah, I think that the momentum part of this goes into the load selection because where the momentum is really started with is just too heavy of loads more often than not. Do you have any other common training mistakes you see with arms? Getting fixated on the the hand positioning of like I did a tricep push down with uh, a uh, a pronated hand position and this is if you're watching <laughs> your hand is down it, uh, supinated would be your hand facing the ceiling so they do a tricep 
push down with their with a uh, this hand positioning and then being able to go into the supinated and thinking that it's two different things. Um, where sensationally it may feel a little bit different for you, but in terms of the growth as well as the research, I, I I'm not aware of any research that is going to illustrate a difference in in tricep growth relative to how you're gripping a handle or a cable for a push down. Um, and it makes sense because your tricep is not acting upon the wrist. It is acting upon the the ulna specifically, but at the upper portion. So you're not having any change in, in the positioning for the insertion of the tricep. So that is one thing there that's not necessary. And I would honestly just encourage you to have a neutral hand placement, um, which is going to generally feel the best from an elbow uh, perspective. Well, I'll go ahead and ask you some questions that we have from the listeners. And the first one actually flows perfectly from what you just said. Does hand positioning change the portion of the tricep that is being trained? No. All right. Should women train their arms directly? Is direct arm work needed? I think throughout the episode, we have confirmed yes. <laughs> Will arm workouts burn fat? In some form of capacity, we're, you know, we're, we're getting to the research. I think that there is a level of, of blood flow circulation, necessity of nutrients, burning the muscle glycogen that will have to have some implication of the stored fat in that area being broken down, utilized for energy in some way. Do I know how mechanistically that would work? Not at this moment, but I do think that there's some, something that needs to be discovered. Mm -hmm. Will training arms make me look bulky? Training arms make me look bulky. Do you already feel like you look bulky? Because I, I would say that nine times out of 10, the person who's thinking that training a specific muscle group is gonna make them look bulky already believes in their head that they're bulky. So then they're just trying to have something to pinpoint and say, this is why I'm bulky. Mm. So no, I do not think that training arms is going to make you bulky. Does training arms increase testosterone? That's my knowledge. If my biggest goal is to grow my arms, how often should I train arms? If your goal is to grow your arms, I would try to make it work three days a week. I would try to have volume with your push session or your pull session, and then having a dedicated day that's fully just arms. And that has been the best response that I have gotten uh, with clients of my own, spreading it across three days, having one day that's fully dedicated. And then for your push sessions, you could have it be your bicep work if you wanted to. Triceps are probably going to be the easiest, but your triceps may be fatigued from the push volume that you already had and vice versa within the pull. So figure out what's going to be best for your performance as well as your recovery to get to the full arm day, generally at the end of the week, um, and be able to be recovered to get the most out of that session too. Now, this is a little bit of a side question, but I have had it asked to me before of when it comes to biceps. So it is going to be like that peak on your arm when you're flexing. A lot of times people say like throw up that double bicep or that's even what people do to just show that they have muscles. What if I feel like mine is like short? It, will training biceps like lengthen that to make it more of my arm? You got to talk to your parents. <laughs> that insertion point is going to be very genetic. So um, some individuals are, they have, massive arms, but they have a really low insertion point. So when they go into that uh, double bicep, then it looks as though that they don't have much of a peak. But the reality is that the insertion point is just lower on their arm. Whereas that higher peak, as you actually grow your arm is going to be of large benefit to you because as you throw that front double bicep up, you're going to have a massive peak. So if it's short, good thing for you, you just need to get more density. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that shows within even just looking at athletes that are shorter or taller of like someone who's taller, they can have, they have to have so much more muscle on them for it to look the same as someone who's possibly shorter because they have so much more volume to fill up. And so if you have that longer insertion point and I have it for my glutes, which I'm very thankful that I have that lower insertion point for my glutes, but it is just a lot more surface area to add density to. And so it can be a little bit longer road. Correct. All right. Well, that's all that I have. Do you have anything else about arms that you want to add in here? I don't believe so. I mean, it's very straightforward, but I do think that the things that we talked about are important to do mm -hmm. because if you're not doing the, the basics and the things that we spoke about today, your arm training is going to suffer. So you, you do exactly what we talked about in this episode. You're going to get jacked. Yeah. And don't forget to get the cheat sheet down below in the show notes. And then we also have a playlist going over a lot of the exercises that we talked about. So you know exactly how to perform 
inform them. And don't forget to catch next week's episode with Chris Bearcat. So we'll catch you in that one.